Okay, everybody, welcome once again to the Meat Potato Show, conservative talk and awesome rock. And as I've said before on other interviews, and I will keep repeating here up until that big kahuna day, we are, the Kennedy interviews are rolling on here on the Meat Potatoes 2012 Conservative Media Network as we gear up for a candidate symposium coming up here at Brad's wonderful Liberty Clubhouse building. I've already gotten a lot of stuff set up. That'll be happening on August 30th at 6 p.m. We're looking at anywhere from 25 to 30 candidates. Probably going to talk about it about 80 to 100 people in total as far as guests and media and everybody else is concerned. And an individual who will be showing up there on August 30th. He's running uh, as a Republican for the 32nd Middlesex District for state representative. 32nd Middlesex District covers uh, parts of Melrose, Wakefield, parts of uh, Malden. Uh, he did undergraduate studies at the University of Colorado. He was a Fulbright scholar in Germany and uh, went to graduate school in MIT and got his PhD in chemical engineering in 2005. This is his first time running. He's running, uh, again, as I said, the 32nd Middlesex uh, District. That seat was held by Paul Broder and in it's 2000, it, it is held by him. It is still held by him. In 2000, and in 2010, it was vacated by Catherine Clark, who went on to become a state senator. And in 2012, the seat went uncontested, which is a big problem that has been happening here in Massachusetts. But this year, it is not uncontested. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, John Locke. John, thank you so much for coming. Right, thanks for having me. Great. Uh, so, first question, what made you throw your hat in the ring? What uh, got you going on this? Well, I'm a, uh, not a career politician. I'm a citizen candidate. Sure. And uh, like a lot of people across the country, I've been increasingly frustrated with the direction our government's going. And you have to step up if you're going to change things. And so um, I've been, uh, politics has been kind of an evolving thing for me. Um, I began getting involved with signature drives and things like that. Um, this year I thought I, you know, um, I, I would also say in 2012 I was, I was blogging and trying to uh, affect some of my friends and family's opinions on the presidential election. And um, this year I thought I'd bump it up a little bit and be a star volunteer for whoever would be uh, challenging the, the state representative in my district. Um, as, as we'll discuss later, I'm sure I'm, I'm a fan of the Article 5 Convention of States movement, so I wanted to um, talk to whoever is going to be challenging the incumbent in that sure. seat and try to get them on board thinking in, in those lines, um, thinking about things that they could do beyond the state even uh, with respect to their seat in the state legislature. And, um, and lo and behold, there was no one stepping up. Really? Um, so I, I waited, I waited, I um, waited until the deadline to pull papers and things like that. And, and I was there at the deadline pulling papers. Um, and so then I, I collected the signatures. Um, 150 signatures is yeah, a low threshold, right? That's actually a tiny amount. It's that's a low that. threshold. So for state senators, it's 500. Which it starts. I think that's still not that many, really. Right. Um, as an individual, that would you'd feel the sting of that. Mm -hmm. But with a little team, that would be a manageable thing. So um, it's a low threshold to run. Um, it's a it's it's a daunting thing to come out as a as a, a, a sure. contender for a seat or as a challenger. Um, so that's the hardest thing, really, is coming out as a candidate. Um, but in terms of the logistics, pulling papers to signatures, it's a low threshold. And so I wish a lot more people would do it. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, again, I've interviewed, a, you've seen it, I've interviewed a whole bunch of candidates this year. This is something I've been doing for quite some time. Um, it is, it's actually, I'm going to use the word quite easy. I mean, 150 signatures and boom, you're on the ballot. Yes. I mean, I know you got to hit the pavement and try to get your friends and everybody else to try to sign on to it. That's actually a very low number. And one of the things that I've been, uh, very impressed with, with all the candidates, and you're probably doing the same thing, is everyone's hitting the streets, door mm -hmm. knocks, yeah. heading to every single <laughs> event they can get to that they can fit onto the calendar. Are you doing the same thing? You bet. Yesterday was a big festival, Italians called in yeah. Whitfield, where they closed down Main Street and some of the side streets, and all the merchants come out and have booths. And uh, Richard Tissay was there. Um, there was a Democrat and a Republican booth where Tyranny and some of the Republican candidates were. My, um, my opponent was there, Paul Broder had a booth. Um, Jason Lewis, who's the uh, state senator in our district, had a booth. 
Um, Monica Medeiros was there as a, and she was had a strong presence in the uh, Republican town committee booth. Um, so there was, I, I would say, half a dozen uh, candidates who had booths of some sort. A lot of people get kind of miffed about that. It's like, you know, they have something like you said, the, the festival, and then the candidates and the politicians show up, and it's, a lot of people get miffed. It's like, oh, no, we're here to do this. You know, that's something, I don't believe in that. I think, I think it's prime. It's prime real estate. It's, it's a prime spot. You got, it's a captive audience. You got hundreds, if not thousands of people there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not like you're pushing it. People, People tend to come up to you guys and ask questions. If you have good enough candy, they do. Sure. I was at Elm Park for the 4th of July, ran into a whole bunch of people that were running there. And of course, you know, when they talked about my show, and you know, they were, they, some of them had been on, and we talked about the 30th. And then I read in the Worcester Magazine that there was an article about how, you know, it was just a scathing article that this was not the place. And it was so funny. The 4th of July isn't about politics. And I threw the paper down. It was like, what? <laughs> Who writes yeah. this stuff? Of course, the Fourth of July is about politics. Yeah, we had a festival in Wakefield earlier this summer. It was on the lake, and there were um, as many tents, I think, but candidates were expressly forbidden from participating. Really? Really? So I checked into it, and eventually I held my signs on the sidewalks outside of yeah. the event. Not nearly as much traffic as if I was in the event. Mm -hmm. But yeah, candidates were expressly forbidden, but there were a couple of candidates that did a very good job getting around that. They had um, maybe half a dozen or a dozen volunteers wearing t-shirts for their campaign, just walking through you the can't stop. So, That's it. So I thought that, that was, I thought that was brilliant. Excellent. Um, so let's talk about Article 5. You um, as you know, you, and thank you for looking at some of my stuff. Oh, yeah. One of the reasons, uh, the little disclaimer there, I'm putting that together not as somebody who knows a whole heck of a lot about it. The reason why I started putting that together is because, quite literally, I don't know that much about it. So I thought to myself, well, I'll do two things. I'll educate myself on it, I'll talk to people, and because I do the show, I was like, why don't I have them on the show? Yeah. And why don't I write about what I've learned and what I've discovered and what I've researched and what some of these people say? And there was, I was supposed to have somebody from the Massachusetts delegation on. I reached out earlier to a woman in Georgia uh, from, she's the director down at the Georgia Convention of States, and she came on the show and... Um, that was a phone interview, right? That was, was a phone was interview. Fantastic. It was right. a great interview. It was a great, I loved, I loved having, that, uh, having that individual on. I, you'll have to go through, I, I don't really have permission to repeat her name, but anyway, she's out there anyway, she's yeah. on the show. So, but what it ended up happening is, as I did subsequent interviews after that, one of the things I had mentioned in my interviews was I quite literally said, well, this convention of states is Article 5. It, it doesn't sound like a good idea. It sounds like a bad idea. And the next person I was supposed to have on from the Massachusetts delegation, it was a couple of weeks ago. My calendar's over here. It was a couple of weeks ago she was supposed to come on. And she quite literally sent me an email. I don't think I'm going to come on to your show and continue. And then what happened is I got subsequent emails from other people in the group. Somebody had sent a message to the national headquarters about what I had said and sent the video in. Whatever the national headquarters said. The, the email quite literally said, uh, we spoke to the people at national. Oh. Whatever that means. <laughs> and they agreed that none of us should come on to your show. So, the, uh, so the whole states, I was thinking, wow, I could go to 50 states, this thing could blossom into a whole year-long show that I could do. <laughs> and this is like giant toilet flushing. <laughs> <laughs> no. But anyway, I had the John Birches on, I had Dan McGonagall on, but let's talk about because it sounds like you know something about it, so ed yeah. educate me, educate my audience. Yeah, so um, I, I must say, I got into this notion, so for people who aren't aware of the Article 5 um, <laughs> issue, so Article 5 refers to the article in the Constitution that governs how amendments are yes. proposed and ratified by the states. And so far, all of the amendments after the Bill of Rights have all been proposed by two-thirds of Congress, and then they come down to the states and have mostly been ratified by three-fourths of the states. There's a couple of exceptions in there. Mm -hmm. But three-fourths of the states is what it takes to ratify an amendment. And there is a never-yet-used mechanism in Article 5 which allows two-thirds of the state legislatures across the country and to tax convention of states. It's called Convention of States. Um, they are allowed to come together upon application to Congress yes. 
to uh, propose amendments to the Constitution, which are then ratified by three-fourths of the states or by a convention within the states. Um, so uh, it's literally a way for the states to bypass Washington, D.C., to bypass Congress, to bypass the President, and propose amendments to the Constitution that might not otherwise be proposed. Mm -hmm. The favorite one that cuts across most political boundaries is congressional term limits. A lot of people would really like to see um, term limits on Congress. Um, a lot of people don't realize that, you know, they take it for granted that the president is limited to two terms. Yes. It's just the way it is. And it wasn't before a constitutional sure. amendment was introduced and passed. And um, God forbid if, if that weren't the case, I think, um, you know, history might have been a lot different if presidents were allowed to just run and run and run. Um, we've seen a lot of um, even democratic places like Germany, people are in power a long, long time, for decades. And so um, a certain agenda can really move far in a decade or more that they are in power. Disenfranchising any opposition groups, yeah. disenfranchising the population. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so we see a lot in um, Congress too, I think, people just building power as they yeah. remain in Congress. 30, um, 40 year incumbents. Yeah, yeah, that was never really it was never intended to be that so. way. And a lot of people don't think so. And a lot of people look at um, their congressperson who lives in Virginia. <laughs> and, you know, Fairfax County in Virginia has a lot of Congress people that are not representing the states that sent them there. And so I think that a, uh, a reasonable term limit for Congress is something Democrats, Republicans, Independents could really get behind. So that's a favor, for example, that isn't likely to be proposed by Congress, right? No. So why would Congress do that? Um, they might do that if they see the writing on the wall, see some states coming together, building momentum, and wanting to prevent a convention of states from occurring. They might propose something like that, but really without a lot of pressure, um, it's going to be the status quo moving forward until we insist on term limits for Congress. Now, so what that's the, an example. Yeah, one of the things I've been, uh, as I've been researching this and doing the uh, expose, I've leaned more towards being in favor of a convention of the states rather than uh, Congress themselves doing an Article 5. That premise being, I mean, look at the caliber of people in Congress. The Harry Reid's, the Nancy Pelosi's, the mm -hmm. Sheila Jackson Lee's, those types of people. You know, we don't want them proposing amendments that, that my big concern, as I've stated in the expose, and some of the other people I've interviewed concur that, I mean, the, the problem would be that, okay, we propose amendments, but at some point in time, at when the convention starts, when we actually vote, when the web gets together at the big convention hall to decide that, yes, this is what it's going to be, that the possibility of just saying, well, let's just get rid of the Constitution. I've read several different articles that there are different people that have actually proposed that maybe we should rewrite the Constitution. Maybe not necessarily get away with it, get, uh, do away with it, but just rewrite it. And anytime those thoughts come into the conversation, that's when I get the chill on my spine. Well, how, how, I guess my question, yeah. how do we stop that? How do we... Yeah, well, um, let's back up one Go step ahead. first, um, which is the premise of this Convention of States in Article 5 of the Constitution. Um, I'm, I'm of the belief that that was included as a way for states to affect the Constitution without relying on the federal government. The people that put the Constitution together were very aware yes. of tyranny of the federal sure. government, what it could become. Even though they were created, yeah. that's they, why they put all yeah. those checks and balances. They had just fought a revolution against tyranny, and they were trying to give states a way out, if need be, to affect the Constitution. I think it was put in Article 5 in good faith for the states to come together yes. and say something's not working, we want to amend the Constitution because of our experience with the Constitution. There's something that's not quite right. Too much power is going to Washington, D.C. after all. Yeah. And so when I hear um, that, uh, you know, I've heard of this convention states referred to as a con, 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 for yeah. example. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, I think we can all agree it's not a con in the Article 5 in a sense that it's a poison pill or something sure. put in there by yeah, the Yeah, and I, I don't subscribe to that. 
Yeah, so it is something that was put in the, in the Constitution to give the states power to amend the Constitution. And I just worry, as I see so many tools that are left to us in the Constitution not get used. Yes. We, um, we are not allowed to shut down the government anymore, which means that we don't have the power of the purse that the legislature, the House of Representatives, is supposed to have. So that's a big thing that, that we what don't have. I remember you know, right. we went to uh, the Tea Party. We went, uh, uh, 2013, I think it was, 2012 or 20, I can't remember now. We went down there for the um, for the rally that was in Washington, D.C., um, and a lot of the speakers came out, and then shortly after that, the government shutdown yeah. happened. And I was having arguments with people that said, oh, it's, it's the Republicans' fault, and it's the Tea Party's fault, and they're the opposition party. And I kept saying, no, this is... This is part of, this is in our Constitution. They, they, Congress has the power of the purse, and, and they are empowered with saying no. And the public and the right. media spun that. As and that's what I'm saying. They spun it all they around. They became political. Shut down the government. We want to shut down the government, and that's not what they wanted to do. They wanted to prevent paying for Obamacare. Right. They wanted to. They you know, want to with spending yeah. bills. It's like, yeah. look, we need the government right. Right. Here, they, which is they not going to blow that. Everything else except right. Obamacare. That was the last barrier in the road before the implementation of Obamacare. Right. They were a few that knew what the risks were to Obamacare. They didn't realize how disastrous it would be when it got implemented. It yeah. really was disastrous right. in terms of its implementation. Well, I covered it on my show. 2009, yeah. I spoke to a lot of people when right. I was on the radio. But well, how are the purses for that? And it's been used successfully on the other side, for sure. I mean, we have a 2006, I think, um, Border Fence Act or something like that. It's never, it's been, never been funded. And so um, there are, you know, suddenly when it's a massive centralized government agenda, you know, it's shutting down the government. But anyway, it was the president that shut down the government by refusing to concede on that point. He shut down the government in order to um, stop everything he could, which is still not much, could. right? right. Um, spent a lot of money putting barriers up around bear, I call them barricades, <laughs> around <laughs> open air memorials and things like that. Yeah, um, things that were already yeah. paid for, and many so, of them privately owned. Right. I mean, so the media oh, and the public done. has, a, yeah, the media and the public, um, for now anyway, it could change in the future, but they've essentially taken that power of the purse away from us, which is, um, a, you know, you remember the House of Representatives is the closest body in Washington, D.C. that represents the people. And so that is really a tool of the people to put the kibosh on unpopular programs that yeah. the D.C. passes. The other one that, um, you know, we, even I kind of agree. I think it's a bad time to impeach the president, for example. You could probably go down a whole list of impeachable offenses that the president has done, or maybe with a little bit of, um, you know, if you took some obstruction of justice away, it could be shown that he's done um, and is planning to do with respect to amnesty, which may or may not be announced in some executive action or something coming forward. Anyway, there are probably some good reasons to think about impeachment, for example. Um, it would be politically disastrous, I think, a lot of people have decided. It would but, consume a lot of time, too, in our Congress. Yeah. But you're looking at a good year, if not yeah. more. But there's another, I mean, can you imagine how much worse it would have to be before you'd consider impeachment seriously then, right? So that's another tool in the toolbox, another check that the citizens have on the government that's essentially taken away. And I, I worry that Article 5 is a little bit like that, where we look at, no, no, we don't want to do that. There's risks to it. Where, what else is in the Constitution for us? It feels like a lot of tools that we're leaving in the drawer and not using. So I worry about that, about not utilizing the safeguards that the founders left the, the citizens and just leaving them unused. And I feel like now is a good time to rein in the federal government with Article 5, and so um, you know, it can't get much worse than this in a sense of overburdensome regulations and yeah. all-encompassing government, the circle of liberty getting s smaller and yeah. smaller. You, at some point, you have to push back. I think I would be, I would like to wait yeah. until after this election, see how the House and Senate shakes out, yeah. um, see if some of these ne'er-do-wells and these uh, 
career politicians. Yeah. Harry Reid, you know, all the, I don't think these, not, no, he's not up again. He's not up this year. Um, but what I'm saying is get rid of a lot of the people that are the problem. And you know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. I'm not just talking about uh, saying, oh, the, the Republicans are the greatest thing since sliced bread. Of course, we all know that the Republicans themselves are just as much to blame. But I would feel much more secure and much calmer if I knew that we had a, a pro Tea Party, pro liberty, or right wing. Go yeah. move more to that center right yeah. as opposed to this center left, yeah. almost far left that we're at now. Right. And then let's see, talk about conventions. Yeah. Let's talk about so that. let's talk about that for a minute. Go ahead. Um, I think that your guest from Georgia who is talking about the convention of the states is probably a little um, uh, optimistic in terms of how soon such a thing can yeah. come together. There have to be applications from 34 of the states yes. in order to even consider. And the application right. has to be worded exactly the same yes. for every state. Yeah, and I have the wording if anyone wants Good. to hear. Oh, yeah, um, in a minute. Yeah, yeah sure. so um, that's right. So it's got to be identical applications, which isn't written in the Constitution, but that's kind of That's a good rule to have. I would yeah. agree to that. So anyway, that that is kind of the premise that we're using is that it's got to be identical applications, which is a good premise. Um, and so I think it's optimistic that 34 states would get behind that within a couple of years or maybe even within a few years. This may be a longer term project. And if we get to the point where 34 states are passing in their legislatures the kinds of bills that would be needed to send this application yeah. to Congress, I feel like we'll have the people around. If it just have the drive, yeah. You'll we'll have the demographics, if you will, in the in the legislatures and in Congress to maybe not in Congress, right? It's supposed to actually be against Congress if you do this. So regardless of what's in Congress, you would have um, the demographics for something I think that's favorable. Most of the, I think I don't have the exact numbers, but I think we're at any somewhere around thirty to thirty-five states that have Republican and Republican-controlled House and Senate yeah. and Republican government. I mean governors. Um, so, and from the research that I've done and the people I've talked to, we're we're close. We're very close. I think we're looking at 28 or 29 or 28 states. Yeah, that we're, we're, we're at to Republicans are of different breeds, right? right? And so, Arizona is an example of a state where the the legislation has come in front of their uh, House and Senate, I believe, and they have a Republican Speaker of the House who has killed it, right? He doesn't want it, right? Wow. So. There are still um, there are still hearts and minds to win over, and I think that if nothing else, it's this is a fairly obscure part of the Constitution that citizens don't really know about, and so I I like talking to people about it when I knock on doors. People like the idea of congressional term limits, and people are generally unaware of Article Five in the Convention of States. Um, they know that the Amend, you know, amendments have occurred. They think it's through Congress and ratified by the states. A, you know, a lot of people are not aware that the states can get together. So it's an education. Um, it's an education campaign to let people know that there is something that they can do, right? Because people are frustrated. They want to know what can they do when they see um, government growing bigger and bigger. And political movements and uh, pol uh, yeah, political movements and things like the amendments to constitutions and see changes in our government and in the course mm -hmm. of the country, they don't necessarily come like overnight. Some yeah. radical things happen because of, I don't know, like we were attacked at Pearl Harbor, obviously there were radical things that happened. 9-11 radical things happened. But by and large, I mean, you, you look at the abolitionist movement moving into slavery, I mean, we're, I mean, to uh, the Civil War. You're talking about from Jackson all the way to Lincoln. That's a large swath of historical time. You look at Prohibition, it started around the turn of the century, but it really didn't, it took like another 20, 20 or 25 years before it actually finally right. came into play. So again, these movements yeah. don't happen overnight. It's yes. the same thing with what we're doing with the Convention of States in Article 5. Yeah. When, when I spoke to Alex Shirtlett from the John Birch Society here, he had said to me, he said, oh, this has been going on for quite some time now. It's not, it's not a new thing. And yes, we've been fighting it. But even he said, you know, even if it does happen, it's going to take uh, three or four years for all this to work to make its way through the states to get ratified. It might not even get ratified, which means it's got to go back Again. So again, you're looking at 10, 20, 30 years before yep. maybe. And I think it was written to have that kind of barrier. Yeah, it was written time. to be tough. Yes. Right. 
And so I feel like that's one of the safeguards in yeah. place for Article 5. And also, when you think about the growth of government and the centralization of health care and education and all these things, even that's been that wasn't slow. overnight. Right, that's been a right. slow. Yes, so, so it's going to probably take us that long to bring it back into Realistically, I think so. Yeah. I said to you know, my kids, they, you know, what do you teach you, Dad? Why do you get all involved in this? I said, I'm doing it for you. It's like, what do you mean? I said, I'm not doing it for me. I'm going to be an old man and I'm still going to be fighting this. Mm -hmm. But then you're going, to, you're going to grow up, you're going to have kids, and you'll start to see yeah. the changes occur. It's not for our generation. Right. It's like, this is why a lot of us run. It's like, we don't, well, these guys now are doing it for a career and get their money and their pensions. But the real purpose, as stated by our founders, is you do it for the next generation. Right. You serve as an older man, you serve a, a few years. It's kind of like the last paragraph of your resume. And then he died. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He served two terms in Congress, right. and then he died. Right. That, that's the way it was. But yeah. that's what I tell my children. It's like, it's not, it's not for me. Right. It's for you, and it's for your kids. Yeah. And only then, when you're my age, you'll start to see the changes. And they're yeah. like, well, what does it take? It's like, because that's the way it's supposed to be. You don't right. want it. You don't yeah. want this cataclysm overnight. Right? Yeah, so people um, worry about the virtue of the politicians. I think mm -hmm. there's time to change yes. the demographics of the... Why don't you find that, because, uh, um, yeah, find the... Uh, the oh, sure, the language. Yeah, the language in, in the proposals, right? Sure, it's, um, it's a little lengthy, but uh, it's, it's just one page, so I'll read it. Yeah, no, go ahead, please. So this would be an application that the states would pass within their legislatures and then submit to Congress. And upon receipt of 34 of these, Congress would call a convention of states. That's the idea. And, and we can talk just a little bit about some of the some logistics of that. Uh, so here it goes. This was written by the folks in Georgia who have headed up more or less a convention yeah. of states. It's called, and they'd like it to be called the Georgia, um, I, I forget, uh, bill or something like that. So, Whereas the founders of our Constitution empowered state legislators to be guardians of liberty against future abuses of power by the federal government, and whereas the federal government has created a crushing national debt through improper and imprudent spending, and whereas the federal government has invaded the legitimate roles of the states through the manipulative process of federal mandates, most of which are unfunded to a great extent, and whereas the federal government has ceased to live under a proper interpretation of the Constitution of the United States, and whereas it is the solemn duty of the states to protect the liberty of our people, particularly for the generations to come, by proposing amendments to the Constitution of the United States through a convention of the states under Article 5 for the purpose of restraining these and the related abuses of power, be it therefore resolved by the legislature of the state of fill in the blank, Massachusetts. Section one, the legislature of the state of Massachusetts hereby applies to Congress under the provisions of Article five of the Constitution of the United States for the calling of a convention of the states limited to proposing amendments to the Constitution of the United States that impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and limit the terms of office for its officials and for members of Congress. Section two, the Secretary of State is hereby directed to transmit copies of this application to the President and Secretary of the United States Senate and to the Speaker and Clerk of the United States House of Representatives and copies to the members of said Senate and House of Representatives from the state, also to transmit copies hereof to the presiding officers of each of the legislative houses in several states requesting their cooperation, so some logistics there. And section three, this application constitutes a continuing application in accordance with Article five of the Constitution of the United States. It takes time, right? Until the legislatures of at least two thirds of the several states have made applications on the same subject. So what they say at the end there is, is yeah. we're gonna keep continuing this, it's gonna keep going on, based on that format yeah. until we reach that magic number. And that's there was a bit of a constitutional question that came up in 2013 where over time, it's been decades, but people have been you know, chewing on a balanced budget amendment for a while. Okay. Right. They actually had counted that they had received 34 applications on that. And it turns out that, well, over the years, some have withdrawn their applications, some <laughs> have done this, some have resubmitted. It's unclear, like, do we call a convention? We have 34 applications. They have to figure out, are they current, are they not, right? So there's some- um, But that's why that language is right. continuing. So it doesn't matter if 
Yeah. But if it's from five years ago, that yeah. still applies. It does, and so people are wondering now, the state applies, and then the next generation of legislators takes it out, is it out? I think it should be, but you know, there's some a wiggle room there, right? Like, what if we rescind our application? Is it, you know? But it should be that. official. It should be right. a, an official declaration that we officially rescind yes. this declaration. And I think that's how And we so. send it back for resubmission right. at a later date. Like I mean, the language has to be worded out. Yeah, right. so when you think about some of the arguments of Article 5 about how tyrannical Congress could be in calling a convention and setting rules and things like this, because that's one of the worries of Article 5 is that the um, Article 5 of the Constitution only directs Congress to call a convention of states. And there's some question as to how those rules are you know, um, established and things like that. I think that uh, the states feel that they can set the rules and some constitutional scholars feel you know, that Congress has all the jurisdiction there. But you know, there's probably 34 applications in for some balanced budget amendment. They could already do something like that sure. if they wanted to. One of the, uh, I talked to Catherine White from Constitution Dakota. She was on the show, and, what, and I spoke to her again with Stephanie Davis, and Stephanie and Catherine are going to be here at the symposium. One of the things that she had mentioned is that language is all well and good. Yeah. And, and yeah. yes, all the states, that the 34 states can agree on that, right. but something happens when it goes yeah. to Congress. Congress gets hold of it. Yeah. And they can say, okay, thank you for the application. Yeah. Now this is what we're going to do. Yeah, so the, That's one of my fears. So yeah. clarify yeah. Or, or correct well, me if I'm wrong. Or, or you know, just stir the pot a little bit and get us thinking, right? So the sure. uh, Article 5 says that they shall can call a convention of states. And that's not been under any sort of, um, that's not controversial. They will call a convention of states per the Constitution. But then there is a catch-all in Article 1 of the Constitution, which establishes what Congress can do. Mm -hmm. And there's this final uh, catch-all at the very end of the article that says, well, they can make up whatever rules they have to in order to do whatever the government is supposed to do. It's like, a, you know, Congress, I don't have the exact language of Article Congress 1. Congress changes the rules of procedure right. all the time, well, the voting yeah. procedures. And it's yeah. like they just do it. One of the big questions I ask all the candidates it seems like these guys in Congress, they, they're just making stuff up right. off the top of their heads. That's one of the things I wanted to push back on that a little bit is, um, you know, a lot of people think we shouldn't do Article 5 because they could set the rules and things like that. But you know what? They have a lot of um, influence over election rules, right? Yeah. We still do elections, see it all the time. right? That's what I said. That's what I said a minute ago. It's like they just change the rules right. in the middle of the game. But, Weird. But we still do elections. We insist on doing elections. I mean, there are some uh, tools that the citizens were left in the Constitution that I think should they should embrace and exercise if they need to use them. So I just wanted to kind of lay that out there as an example of, well, how about elections? You know, elections have some influence from uh, the, the feds, right? States are trying to impose their voter ID requirements, things like that, and the feds come down. They have some influence over that, um, but, but we still do elections, and I think we should still do an Article 5. And, uh, yeah, and also, I wanted to reiterate this, this language whereby 34 of the states would have to submit something that, identical to what I read. If you had that much of the nation behind this agenda, and Congress then did something completely different. I think you would have a big problem there. I think that there would be so much support for something like that. that the media would be all over it too. The media, even though I guarantee, even the mainstream, the liberal media would be all over it because they would they would be well, gearing up to this, covering this for a year or two years, like an election, how they get going on right. an election, and then finally at the end, suddenly boom, this kibosh, and then the. It would just take this different direction. And I think you're right. I think there'd be immense pressure on Congress, uh, not Congress uh, alone, but Senate. And even if the president got involved, I mean, now we're looking at a potential constitutional crisis. Well, then you start to go back all the way to the Declaration of Independence of, oh, well, this government isn't working for us anymore, right? I mean, sure. literally, this is so. I like your analogy of the tools in the toolbox. We're kind of limiting ourselves by yeah. not. By not employing what we have, it's like going to fight a battle and leaving the ammunition at home. You know. Right, right. And 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 so um, 
you know, I feel that there are some safeguards in place, and I know that one of the concerns is, well, they'll just say that the uh, attendees of the convention will be the legislators or something like that, right? Have you heard that argument no. that, that Congress and their rules making will say, well, we need a convention of states. Let's choose the senators from those states to – Yeah. You know, that's that's right. one of, oh, I see what you're saying. That was one of the big right. concerns when I talked to Catherine uh, yeah. White and, and uh, Stephanie mm -hmm. Davis and uh, one Al Shurtleff and Dan McGonagall were here. And, and that was their concern that something yeah. like that could happen. But then, then again, it brings me back. And I didn't ask the question then, but but because of you being here, you, you helped me help clarify it a little more. Everybody would be watching this, the yeah. media, the world, the country, and if the Congress and Senate did something like again, it would and also it would just they already people would freak yeah. out. And and also we already have delegates of the states in Congress. They can already propose amendments. They're already there. Right. That's the other way that you propose amendments in Article Five is Congress proposes them. So sure. whether you why would you have a convention of states and fill it with Congress, right? They are already in DC. They could already do it. So that one it makes sense. I mean if we were worried about that, I think that that would happen a lot sooner than our Now, we talk about uh, term limits, we talk about the fiscal irresponsibility, yeah. the expansion of the power, which are some of the reasons why this Article yeah. 5 of Convention of States is being is starting to gain momentum. Well, let's look at a few of those. Uh, obviously, we know about the fiscal irresponsibility. We don't, well, I'm not going to hash that, that thing again. One of the big things that scares me is look at our militarization of our police, things like the Patriot Act. Uh, we quite literally have a police force that is Gestapo, in essence, in a lot of places. There's, there's a lot of stuff on my Facebook pages. I'm, I belong to several different uh, organizations online that quite literally every 20 minutes, there is a new posting from somebody in the country somewhere filming a police officer, beating somebody up, tasing somebody, busting into a house. You see stories all the time. Evansville police just recently raided a house arresting a 78-year-old woman and uh, assaulting an 18-year-old girl laying on the couch watching TV on a Saturday afternoon. It was the wrong house. Again, these things are repeated over and over. And these guys have gone ahead, a lot of these police departments have gone ahead and they've passed their own little rules and saying, well, we're immune from prosecution. We're immune from liabilities. Those laws are for the little guys, right? Right, exactly. It, it, this is a big scary thing, and, and it says right there in, in the language, you know, the, the, the power of the government expanding. But it's trickling down into cities and towns and states and, and running for state representative. How, how, do, how do you respond? Look at Watertown after the Marathon bombing. I mean, yeah. what, what, do you, what do you think about that? Well, I feel like there were a lot of, um, uh, you know, a Fourth Amendment uh, sure. violations there. I feel like if the police want to go door to door and knock, then okay. But people have to say, no, you can't search here without a search warrant. Right. And, so, and a person would say, yes, we know who you're looking for. We know why you're looking for. Don't worry, officer. I've checked my house. It's empty. I've checked my garage. It's empty. Right. And I've locked my house. I am carrying, so I'm going to watch out. I said, thank you for your You can look guys. at my boat if you want. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can look at my phone. It's like if you want to just walk around the property real quick, that's fine. But no, you're not coming in. I, I'm telling you, he's yeah. not here. Do you and think I'm going to let him in my house? Right, and, and they may have had the best of intentions along the but way. But it's there, still but a clear violation. But right? there was a violation there, and I think that the conspiracy, you know, the conspiracy theorists out there, which I ascribe to about half of the time. <laughs> yeah. They, but, you know, say, they would say it's just normalizing it, right? Normalizing this police we're presence. Getting, we're getting everyone used to it. And, um, and that is worrisome. Yeah, Look so. at Ferguson, too. Now, in Ferguson, I think to a certain degree, okay, the police should be militarized. It disperse the crowd, stop the burning, stop the looting. I mean, that's out of control. But even still, you know, you're on a nice edge there. Where does, where does your, you know, First Amendment to, to speak freely and gather, gather peacefully? Hello, folks, it's called gather peacefully. You know, as opposed to, all right, we're going to stop their, their bird. They're saying fire to the 7-Eleven. We've got we've to go in there and do something. Right, yeah, so that has been a little bit of a, uh, um, you know, a little bit of a contradiction is we're going to arm the police to the teeth. But they aren't allowed to hurt anybody or to, uh, you know, repel any sort of protest. Right. I mean, what, what's the message here, right? We see a lot I of. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. it's kind of an oxymoron right. there. And we see. They've got all this yeah. gear, and Ferguson is burning right. down. What, what, and if what someone, are you doing? And if someone shoots at you, you can't shoot back. 
what's the message here, right? Exactly. And and we see a lot of that overseas in the in the war theaters too. Is um, okay, we're armed to the teeth, so we should have a clear advantage here, right? But if you can't, you can't use act, that. if there's so many rules of engagement, what's the what's the plan here? Um, but in terms of the militarization of Ferguson, I think it's way overboard. I think it's a massive waste of money. For every Ferguson, you're probably giving all these SWAT team type uh, uh, materials. Day day now. Yeah, you're just you're just spending so much money outfitting every single little town with this kind of equipment. It's a huge waste of money, and we have national guards who are supposed to be mobile and responding to hot spots. I feel like if if society erupts to the degree that you need militarization, then you call in the National Guard well, to quote that. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the National Guard. Patty Dolan was here yesterday uh, doing an interview with me, and we talked about this very same thing. He said the same thing. It's like, this yeah. is what the National Guard is for. And he, he used the line. It was very funny, too. He says, well, maybe if they spent more time here instead of overseas, right. you know, supplementing our military, we could we could use them for what they're supposed to be used for and let the police st you know handle the traffic handle the the you know the calls to 911 and the emergencies on the other hand i think police should have a firearm i there's a lot of european police that don't right um, i don't think they should be uh, downgraded to tasers I feel like they should have a firearm, and I feel safer. Protection, sure. I feel safer as a citizen when I'm shopping in a mall. But there, I don't feel safer because of the rent-a-cop that just has a walkie-talkie. But I feel safer because there's a foot patrol. There, there's a foot patrol, or you know, um, to take it to the extreme, if there was a mall that said this is a gun-free zone, no guns here, you know, no license to carry. I, I look for you, a mall. You can't, you can't. I don't, but I like to have the right to. <laughs> so. And that's the other thing too. But I mean, we talked. To, I talked to some of my other guests on the show about uh, House Bill Four Three Seven Six, um, and Delio was he was this close to pulling another Connecticut and stealing everybody's guns out of their house. But uh, again, I talked to uh, uh, um, Mike Valenzuela and Jacques Perrault on the show, and uh, Jacques Perrault was really good. He went he went over the House Bill Four Four Three Seven Six. And because of the efforts of the Gun Owners Action League and Second Amendment people, and uh, even the NRA got involved, uh, the bill, we used the term watered down, but when I looked at the, the details on the website, I was very relieved. I mean, there were actually a lot of improvements, but my big question to all of them was, why did we need this bill in the first place? They always seem to react to... Well, they were reacting to Sandy Hook. I mean, DeLeo was up there at the podium talking about the horrible, you know, the tragedy of Sandy Hook. We're going to convene the legislature and we're going to do something. And I'm always like, oh, here we go again. And then there are other shootings and it's like, oh, just wait. Sure enough, they do this all the time. They do this all the time. Look what happened in 9-11. I mean, as a, as a potential representative, yeah. how do you put the brakes on this? How do you say, all right, listen, you guys got to calm down a little bit. Yeah. How, how would you approach that? Or, or how do you approach that? Well, I think you just have to point out some instances where it fails, you know. So one of the stories that's come out since that legislation is um, is Leah Cole. She's a state representative from Peabody. Right. She is um, not only a state representative, she's uh, not a career politician. She's also a nurse and has some right. late shifts and things like that and has and to carry. And um, state representative, woman uh, working late hours, she got denied. So it makes it awfully hard for law-abiding citizens sure. to get a firearm. Yes. And the Constitution says that your right to bear arms will not be infringed, and that's infringing on the right to bear arms. Um, it only, uh, and it's not taking guns out. Well, we're of, trying to keep people safe now. But it's not taking guns out it's of the hands of people, people that I worry about. Exactly. Um, and I live in Worcester, and we hear I live up on Vernon Hill. You can hear it in the background. You're not as bad as uh, my my uh, wife. She came from uh, Dorchester from her, her first uh, marriage, and she said you could hear it like every night. You could hear that pop pop in the background, not just once a week, but every single yeah. night. Worcester, it's not so bad, but you can tell that sound. You can tell that sound, and you just know. And then, sure enough, about t ten minutes later, you'll hear the yeah. sirens go by, and it's like, well, it obviously it wasn't a police. Yeah. Shooting somebody, it was somebody robbing a store, some gang member, something that was going on. Right. These are the people you can pass all the damn gun laws you want. 
Right. It's going to make no hill of beans difference to me. Yeah. It really is. And, and I don't know how gold has rated me. Um, people could look it up. I'm not exactly sure, but I probably didn't ace their tests exactly. I think that there are uh, some maybe uh, people fresh out of prison or something. I don't know. I think that there could be uh, certain of segments be, of, right, the, of the population right. where you case might. Case by case basis. Right. Um, but I think when people say, okay, we want to keep it out of the hands of mentally ill people or something like that, I, I agree with that to a certain extent, but I worry about what they're going to classify as mentally ill, right? It's like, oh, uh, you've been to counseling once in your life, does that mean you're mentally ill? And I think I that's where I've been in 12 years of recovery, I've had a drink for 12 years. And, and that's another thing, you know, if you get stopped um, for a DUI at some point in your past, then that that makes you ineligible to get a firearm from yeah, some of these sheriffs. And one of the things, um, I was not always on the right side of the law when I was a younger kid. I mean, there's no felony, but it's all just stupid kid shit that you did with them. Sorry, the other, I'm sorry, it's my show. It's, it's just that kind of stuff. Really that like the way here, right? But exactly. But you know, you know, obviously, I grew up, had kids, and, and matured, and stopped doing all those silly things. But yeah. I would, I wanted to pursue it in the town where I live in North Row, and no, the back at that point in time, the chief of police had just carte blanche. No, you just couldn't do it. At least now, with the way the bill is written yeah. now, you have to go to court. The chief of police now has to petition the court, which I think puts more control uh, as far as the proper legal channels is concerned and more control into the person like myself. I can go to court and actually plead my case now. You Probably. shouldn't have to But I know I shouldn't have to. to, I know. They but. should, they, it, the, the burden of proof should be on them that you can't have, right? It should not be on you that you can't have. Ooh, that's absolutely correct. So, um, We've been going on quite a long time. No, thanks a lot for coming on. And thanks for that education on Article 5 again. I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get two titles here that, that yes, it's a John Locke interview, and then maybe maybe we'll do that part five of Article sure, 5. That'd be great. That'd be great. And but you what's, know, what's next for you? Where are you going? What are your events? Well, one, one quick mention on Article 5. I know a lot of people realize that we don't have James Madison and George Mason and Benjamin Franklin and all the others advocating for us right now, but. I think as government grows and grows and grows and puts more restrictions on what you can do and where you can take your life, I think we're more likely to have fewer of those people in the future. So right. I think we need to reign in the federal government, let people live their lives, let people um, do what they set out to do, and we'll have a much better opportunity for those people. I can to agree with that. I can totally agree with that because, as I mentioned earlier, the caliber of individuals that's in our Congress now. However, uh, I would put a silver lining on that cloud by saying, <laughs> but because of that that's going on, look at people like myself and the Tea Party movement, you, yourself, a lot of the candidates, people are waking up, and you said it yourself on all the other candidates that said that we knock on doors and talk to the people. People are becoming savvy now. They're educating themselves. They're becoming yeah aware of what's going on. So maybe the, the Ben Franklins and the, and the Madisons don't exist in our government. Yeah. Maybe they exist on Main Street yeah. USA. So one step back, two steps forward, right? I mean, I was devastated when uh, Barack Obama got reelected in 2012. I and couldn't understand but that. I, I probably wouldn't be running as a candidate now had Romney won. I would have felt like the tides are turning and, and I would have looked at where that was going to go. So yeah, um, there's always that benefit that people get energized when things are really going wrong. Sometimes a little revolution is a good thing. So where are you going next? What's your next? You're coming to the 30th, but uh, yeah. what's uh, happening as far as gearing up towards primary? So as a, well, um, so a first-time candidate, uh, you know, I get to take a pass on the primaries. I'm uncontested on the primary. I probably would not be in the race if I was in a primary. I'd probably be volunteering for uh, the, for the person uh, challenging the opponent. Um, so I don't have to um, have a primary race, and neither does my opponent. So it's business as usual all the way up until November. Uh, so um, there's going to be. We'll get you back on too. Oh, I hope so. Because here's the other thing too. Yeah, as even though this thing is happening on the 30th in primary yeah. season, you know, once that all shakes out, mm -hmm. the interview series goes on all the way up to election night because yeah. then then the field narrows and the, and the race becomes more intense. People we'll tune in. Yeah. yeah, people tune in. Yeah, and so um, there are some town festivals. We just had one in Wakefield yesterday. It was a blast. They also had a rained out Fourth of July, so they shot off all their Fourth of July fireworks last <laughs> night, which was really <laughs> 
and in two weeks there's going to be something similar in Melrose, and then another two weeks there's going to be something similar in Malden. So there's going to be those events which um, give you a, a nice break from knocking on doors. It's sure. it's great to just they're fun. Too. They are fun. Yeah, okay. they are fun, and, and you it's it's just as efficient, if you will, in terms of reaching people. So it's good, but it's going to be a lot of door knocking yep. um, beyond that. I'm still uh, looking for contributions, obviously, because I, I have kind of the foundations of the campaign, but there are some yard signs that need to be printed up that I don't yet have the uh, resources to do, but as those get printed up, I already have locations scouted Excellent. around town where right. those can go up. So yeah, there's going to be planning, pre positioning sure. sure. Yeah, so there's going to be some uh, fundraising to uh, happen in the coming couple of months and some door knocking, and it's a grassroots campaign. Because so is there anything you want to let me do? Oh, great, great. Yeah, it's it's a grassroots campaign, so a lot of it is about um, what the what the voters are going to do as well in those next couple months. John, thank you so much oh, for coming on the show. Thanks. Thirty second Middlesex District, Melrose, Wakefield, Malden. John Lark, thank you. Thank you.